Are you a pineapple shape? Pear shape? Orange shape? Apple shape? Obesity comes in all shapes and sizes. But now, the real question is, how did we even get so fat? In today's episode, we will dive into the rabbit hole of obesity and try to get to the bottom of it. The answer might surprise you. We all know obesity is bad. Obesity increases the chances of heart disease, type 2 diabetes, cancer, yada yada yada, the list goes on. But is there anything else that we don't know about obesity? Oh, cute babies. Don't you want to protect these little babies? A latest study by the Columbia University's Mailman School of Public Health found that a mother's obesity in pregnancy lowers the IQ and motor skills in their sons. At age 7, boys whose mothers were obese during pregnancy can have an IQ score lowered by as much as 5 points compared to other normal boys. That's scary! Obesity might not only just screw us over, but it will actually carry on to affect our babies before they were even born. How do you know if you are fat? Don't just rely on the mirror. You can use a simple index called the Body Mass Index. This is an index, otherwise known as the BMI, that you can check using your height and your weight. Some of you might say, Oh my god, BMI is so inaccurate. I could deadlift 600 pounds and I'm 200 pounds of lean muscle mass. Okay, Mr. Muscle Man, BMI is definitely not accurate for you because of your excessive muscle mass. But for regular people, it's a great indicator about whether you are normal, overweight, or obese. So then you get to discover your range. A woman standing at five foot four tall and weighing in at 145 pounds. Her BMI is 25.1 and she's considered as overweight. At the same height of five foot four, weighing in at 180 pounds, her BMI would be considered 31.2, which is medically obese. The healthy BMI range for a female standing at 5 foot 4 or 162 centimeters is between 18.5 and 24.9. That means that her healthy weight would actually be between 109 pounds to 143 pounds. And in kilograms, this is 49 kilos to 65 kilos. Why are we so offended by the word fat? It's just another way to describe something. Just like blonde, brunette, redhead, short, tall, skinny, fat. When did this word become so offensive? It doesn't define who you are, it's just a descriptive factor. When more than 50% of Americans are either overweight or obese, it seems like fat is the new normal. But is there any scientific truth to this? Yes, there is. In fact, according to a 2010 study from the University of Texas Medical Branch, 23% of overweight and obese women in the U.S. believe that they are in normal range, when they're actually pretty overweight. Misjudging our own weight is bad enough. What if we also tend to misjudge our children's weight too? Well, that's exactly what's happening according to a 2014 study in the Pediatric Journal. In the report, Researchers found that more than 50% of parents underestimate the weight of their overweight or obese children. In other words, parents are thinking that their children are less overweight than they actually are. Here's another obesity truth that you don't want to know. Obesity is actually linked to your YouTube use. That's right. How you watch YouTube can actually affect your weight. In 2019, a study done by Dr. John Stillman of Hogwarts School of Medicine found that there's a link between your YouTube habits and your risk of obesity. In the study, Dr. Stillman examined 500 adult-aged males and females about their YouTube consumption behavior. Over a five-year period, Dr. Stillman found that those who like, subscribe, and comment while watching YouTube are less likely to gain weight than those who don't. Dr. Stillman recommends that the best way to reduce obesity is to like this video, subscribe, and hit that notification bell.
How exactly did we get fat? To answer this question, we need to go back in time and investigate our ancestors. From the earliest history of humans, dating back to 2.5 million years ago, we were living the hunter-gatherer lifestyle. Life was hard. There were no crops, there was no cattle, and every time you wanted to eat, you had to go hunt for your own food. Our diet mostly consisted of animal proteins and fat from hunting and fishing. 11,650 years ago, we developed the ability to farm and grow crops. The invention of agriculture gave us a source of reliable foods. We no longer needed to hunt to gather foods. Instead, we were able to grow crops and store them for future use. During this period, we also domesticated many cattle such as cow, sheep, and horses. Our lifespan increased and population growth exploded. See, there was so much food available at the time that even the Egyptians got bored and started building massive pyramids. Or did they? As we started to eat grain, our teeth began to deteriorate, which led to crooked teeth. According to research done by Dr. Weston A. Price in his book, Nutrition and Physical Degeneration, he found that in many native communities, prior to adopting the modern agricultural-based diet, straight teeth was the norm. Once the modern diet was adopted, crooked teeth started to emerge within one generation. Moreover, our pelvic inlet depth also got narrower, which made it more difficult to give birth. Dr. Price recalled a story of a native woman that got married to an English man and later became pregnant. One morning, as the husband woke up from his slumber, and to his surprise, the wife presented him with their newborn baby. Supposedly, she gave birth to the child in the middle of the night by herself because she did not want to wake up her husband. Wow, that's way cooler than the exaggerated childbirth dramas you see on TV. Modern world, everything is fast, everything is big, everything is genetically modified. We are taught to discard our common sense when it comes to food. We intuitively know that eating a large apple is not quite the same as drinking a can of Coke. At the same time, we were told that a calorie is a calorie, despite going against our best instinct. What could possibly go wrong? so original. Look at her pie. Upside down. Oh, how clever. Had to show off my flaky bottom crust. Thanks to Crisco. Crisco? Crisco's the shortening that blends in easy. That makes a real flaky pie crust. Look, flaky even on the bottom. Think I'll try it. Upside down pie. Crisco, silly. For pie crust that's flaky, even on the bottom, use all vegetable Crisco. 70s was an interesting time. All women had big puffy hair and the music was funky. More importantly, 1970s is a significant time period in the US obesity history. Obesity was not a big issue in the 70s. The main concern at that time was cardiovascular disease. In response to that, in February 1977, the Dietary Goals for the United States was published by the US government to reduce diet-related cardiovascular disease and diabetes. In the first edition of the Dietary Goals for the United States, six recommendations were made. Number one was the craziest one of all. It recommended to increase carbohydrate consumption. Number two, it recommended to reduce overall fat consumption. But now we know that fat is good and fat is not the culprit. Number three, 
This one said to reduce saturated fat consumption to account for about 10% of total energy intake and balance that with polyunsaturated and monounsaturated fats, which should account for about 10% of energy each. Number four, reduce cholesterol consumption to about 300 milligrams per day. Finally, one that makes a little bit of sense. Reduce sugar consumption by about 40% to account for about 15% of total energy intake. Number six, reduce salt consumption by about 50 to 85% to approximately three grams per day. There was actually a conspiracy during that 1977 report because at the beginning, they recommended to reduce the meat consumption in order to help with cardiovascular disease. But what happened is that they had so much pushback from the meat industry that they decided to leave out that detail from the report and instead they started focusing to reduce fat consumption because fat was bad. Even though the 1977 report talked about how you should reduce the consumption of sugar, the main theme that emerged from this study was avoiding fat. So the focal point of this study actually became how to avoid saturated fat and make sure that you're not consuming fat in order to avoid gaining weight. This huge shift towards eating low fat foods actually caused a huge problem in the food industry. Because how do you make low fat foods taste delicious while still maintaining the same taste and the same texture? What happened is that they started using artificial fat substitutes and one of those substitutes was patented by Procter & Gamble and it's called Olean. Another thing that they did is that instead of using sugar, they started using something that's called high fructose corn syrup as a sweetener. Since a calorie is a calorie, substituting fat with sugar should not create any problems, right? Wrong. A calorie is not a calorie but more on that later. This is 22 grams of sugar. This is how much sugar we eat in a day in 1915. This is 186 grams of sugar. This is how much sugar we eat in a day in 2011. Enough already. I'm really tired of hearing about cholesterol. I mean, if it's low in cholesterol, it tastes lousy, right? And now there's cheese low in cholesterol. So I asked my friend Carol, have you tried cheese low in cholesterol? You're eating it now, she said. This? I said, this tastes too good. Aha, uh -huh, she said. Aha. Uh Aha. -huh. Uh -huh. Kraft Light Naturals. Reduce fat cheese that actually tastes like cheese. The Fat is Bad Health campaign was successful. People started to eat more carbs and less fat. The total fat intake of Americans dropped 41% from 1980 to 1997. But the total amount of calorie intake actually increased by 9% in that same period. Worst of all, the majority of this increase came from carbohydrates. The obesity rate skyrocketed. The rate for men increased from 12.7% to 33.9%. And the obesity rate for women shot up from 17% to 36.6% from 1976 to 2012. Instead of eating natural fat, we were starting to load up on sugar. So you're telling me that we're eating less fat and getting fatter? This doesn't make sense. It's basically like spending less money and getting poorer. Do you think it's a coincidence that the obesity rate accelerated after we started to follow the 1977 recommendations of a low-fat, high-carb diet? So what's the answer? Should we just ditch the carbs and load up on fat? Have we unlocked the secret to obesity? Is the realization that excess carbs causing weight gain a new phenomenon? Or is it something that we've conveniently forgotten? To answer this question, stay tuned for the next episode where we will investigate different low-carb mysteries such as why Japanese remain thin and healthy despite eating a lot of white rice. And also why low-carb might not be the answer to weight loss.
I'd love to hear what different diet plans worked for you, what kind of experience you have with them, because I read every single comment and I reply to every single comment in my videos. So let me know down in the comments below what you've tried, what diet plans failed and what worked for you, because I'd love to know. And if you like this video, make sure you hit that subscribe button, hit that like button and hit the notification bell. That way, anytime a new episode comes out, you'll be the first one to be notified. I'll see you guys next time. Have a healthy and happy day. Bye. Take 10. Sorry. <laughs> so what's the answer? Should we just ditch the carbs and load up on fat? Have we unlocked the secret to obesity? <laughs>